Patrick, what are you doing back here again? Your last visit was very odd. Mom and Dad, I had to come back because I have another really important question for you. What do you think is the best Batman movie? Uh... You're probably gonna say The Dark Knight, and I get it. It's a great movie and I love it as much as the next guy, but it's not the best Batman movie. See, the best Batman movie is actually the 1993 animated film Batman Mask of the Phantasm, and right now, we're gonna talk about why. So what do I mean when I say best Batman movie? If we're talking best movie with Batman in it, then yeah, it probably is The Dark Knight. It is a masterpiece, it's one of Christopher Nolan's best movies, and it's one of the best examples of strong, visionary filmmaking on a blockbuster scale in the 21st century. But it also more closely resembles Michael Mann's Heat than a Batman comic. It's not what anyone would call comic booky. And Batman is maybe the third most interesting character in the movie. On a quality scale, it's like a 9 out of 10. On a Batman scale, it's maybe a 5. Because if we're talking about a perfect Batman story, it needs to be a bit more gothic, a bit more pulp, more operatic, more comic booky. Like, Gotham City needs to be more than just Chicago. Nolan was obsessed with making everything in Batman's world grounded and realistic, but goddammit, it's not a perfect Batman story if the Batmobile doesn't have fins. Hmm. So, before we can really get into Mask of the Phantasm, we have to step back and talk about Batman the Animated Series. So, Batman has been around since 1939, and in that time there have been an insane number of interpretations of the character and mythology. But what a lot of us would consider the platonic ideal of Batman and his world is the early 90s cartoon originally developed by Bruce Timm and Eric Radomski. It was the perfect synthesis of every previous version of Batman. Gotham City was an exaggerated art deco nightmare that felt like it came out of the 1940s. Everything was draped in heavy shadows, police blimps floated overhead, the night sky was always blood red. Batman and the entire cast were drawn in clean, immediately iconic designs and matched with voice actors who sounded exactly like we'd always imagined. And the writing had a mature and depth that put every other Saturday morning cartoon to shame. Like the 90s Spider-Man and X-Men cartoons do not hold up, but Batman is even better than you remember. After the first season of the show, Warner Brothers asked the folks making it to make a feature film, and here's where they made some really interesting choices. See, just about every live-action Batman movie has followed the same kind of formula where one to three Batman villains try to take over or destroy Gotham City while Batman fights them. And usually these villains have more characterization and depth than Batman himself and are the most interesting part of the movie. But now, this relatively low-budget spin-off of a kid's cartoon goes and flips that totally on its head, delivering a movie that's more original, more structurally complex, and with greater emotional depth than any live-action Batman movie. Like, its main influences are Citizen Kane and Alfred Hitchcock. Guys, this movie fucking rules. Mask of the Phantasm was written by Alan Burnett, Paul Dini, Martin Pascoe, and Michael Reeves, and directed by Bruce Timm and Eric Radomski, who were all the main crew behind the show. They'd already had a year of practice telling Batman stories, so they used the movie as an opportunity to get really ambitious and make some bold decisions. The first of these bold decisions is to create an original villain, something none of the live-action movies have ever attempted to do. It gives the movie some actual mystery because we don't already know everything about this guy going in. So at the start of the movie, the Phantasm, who looks kind of like the Grim Reaper, is showing up all over town and murdering old mobsters. Buzz Bronsky, your angel of death awaits. So this kid's movie is basically about a serial killer. Somehow that got approved. Now this is happening around the same time that a woman named Andrea Beaumont returns to Gotham City, and she gets this beautiful, mysterious, old Hollywood-style introduction. And this kicks off the extended series of flashbacks that make up almost half the movie, where Bruce Wayne's in his 20s, he's returned from his travels and training around the world, he knows that he wants to fight crime, but has yet to make the decision that, hey, I should do that while dressed up in a homemade bat costume. Now these flashbacks chart the course of Bruce's romance with Andrea, who was created specifically for the movie. And in the 78 years that Bruce Wayne and Batman have been around, I'm just gonna say, she might be the best love interest he's ever had. Like, out of all the other Batman movies, can you really tell me you cared about the romantic subplots in any of them? I love The Dark Knight, but Rachel Dawes is not the most compelling character in that movie. When Vicki Vale told Bruce Wayne that she'd loved him since the first time she met him, three days earlier, 
did you really believe her? Honestly, the only one that really works is with Selena Kyle in Batman Returns, since in that movie they're both portrayed as lunatics who get off on dressing up in black leather. And even in the comics, the only really interesting love interests are Catwoman and Talia al Ghul, and let's be real, he doesn't have a future with either of them. Okay, a case could be made for Silver St. Cloud, but I have to get back on topic. What's amazing about the scenes between Bruce and Andrea is that they feel like real people with genuine chemistry. Like the dialogue actually has wit. It feels like it came out of a Billy Wilder film. What happened to you? Trip over some loose cash? It's been three days since we met and still no calls. I figured you must be dead or something. You expect every guy you meet to call you up? <laughs> the ones that are smart enough to dial a phone. The relationship makes sense. You get why they fall in love with each other. But here is where things get really interesting. See, this is happening around the same time that Bruce is starting his whole crime fighting thing. And we all know that when Bruce Wayne's parents were murdered, he made a vow to dedicate the rest of his life to fighting crime. But now he's totally conflicted. He thought the rest of his life was gonna be all about the mission, but then Andrea came into the picture and changed everything. In a movie full of bold decisions, this one might be the boldest. It's a major retcon of Batman's history that, in my opinion, makes the whole thing more interesting. Like, there's this amazing scene where Bruce breaks down at the grave of his parents that digs deeper into Bruce Wayne's psychology than any movie before or since has even come close to. I know I made a promise, but I didn't see this coming. I didn't count on being happy. Seriously, how good is that? Like, while the Nolan movies were really interested in what Batman represents, this movie is actually interested in who he is. And after this, Bruce proposes to Andrea and she accepts, and it seems like he's actually going to have a happy life until she suddenly has to leave the country with her father and tells him to forget about her, and this is where he decides to become Batman. What's amazing about this is it adds a new layer to a story we're so familiar with. Even after the death of his parents, Bruce had a new chance to live a happy life. But when that chance was taken away, he made the decision to turn into the darkness and become Batman. Like the scene where he first puts on the costume, there's nothing triumphant about it. Bruce is shown as a figure entirely in black, and Alfred is horrified when he first sees him. My God. In this story, Bruce Wayne's decision to become Batman is a tragedy. I love it. It's so good. Mmm. Anyway, back to the present. The Phantasm is murdering all these old mobsters, who we realize were the same guys Andrea's father was dealing with in the flashbacks, and Batman is kind of stalking Andrea, who's now dating the city councilman, who's a huge asshole and trying to get the police to take down Batman because they think he's the one responsible for the murders. Because, you know, they look kind of similar. Also, in the greatest casting ever, Councilman is voiced by Hart Bachner, the same guy who played Ellis in Die Hard. Hans. Bobby, I'm your white knight. Also, I never buy action figures, but I love this movie so much that my sister got me these for my birthday last year, and they are the best. And Batman goes and talks to Andrea, who's obviously already figured out who he is because she's smart, and she lays the sickest burn on him in the history of Batman movies. You still following your dad's orders? The way I see it, the only one in this room controlled by his parents is you. Like, that line alone is a better analysis of Batman than all three hours of Batman v Superman. So this one old mobster, this gross dude voiced by Abe Vigoda, who's constantly sucking oxygen out of a tank, he's freaked out that he's gonna be the next one to die. So for help, and this is where things get really good, he goes to see the Joker. Gasp! Can it be? Old Sally the Weezer Velestra! And how cool is it that the most famous villain of all time is a supporting character who only shows up halfway through the movie? And as I assume we all know, the Joker from the animated series, voiced by Mark Hamill, is probably the best version of the character ever. So yeah, even better than the Jared Leto one. And I'm gonna go on the record here and say that even though he only has about 12 minutes of screen time in Mask of the Phantasm, this is the best use of the Joker in any movie. And here is a montage I've prepared of him being great. Down, Rusty. Can't be too careful with all those weirdos around. <laughs> don't touch me, old man. I don't know where you've been. That's it. That's what I want to see. A nice big smile. And in one movie, he gets two iconic introductions. One by using a Tommy gun to shoot the heads off a bunch of singing animatronic robots, and then this one. Tisk tisk. 
and to think our tax money goes to pay those jerks. He's genuinely funny and genuinely scary. He's totally out of his mind, but his decisions all make sense to him. And in another one of the movie's very bold moves, we see the Joker before he becomes the Joker. This is a thing that I'm always really uneasy about. Like, I like the 89 movie, but I really don't like how it gives the Joker a real name and a definitive origin and makes him the guy who killed Bruce's parents. That robs him of so much mystery. But this one works for me because all it really tells us is that he was once a creepy, low-level gangster. That's it. He doesn't have a real name, he doesn't even have a line of dialogue. And since the passage of time between the flashbacks and the present is such a key part of this movie, it makes sense to have the Joker play a role in Bruce and Andrea's past. So this builds to the big third act reveal that Andrea is the Phantasm, and she's hunting down these old mobsters as revenge for them killing her father years earlier. So beyond just being a great love interest, she's a twisted mirror image of Batman. They're both motivated by the murders of their parents, but she's driven entirely by vengeance while he's driven by a desire for justice. I love these toys. And the big finale, by far the best finale in any Batman movie ever, takes place at the Gotham World's Fair. In the flashbacks, we saw Bruce and Andrea visit it, and at the time, it was this shimmering beacon of hope and optimism for the future. Like their relationship at the time. But now, it's decayed and in ruins. Like their relationship in the present. And plus, the Joker is living there, sort of infecting it like a disease. Now kids, this is what we call symbolism. It's not subtle, but it is effective as hell. So Bruce, Andrea, and the Joker have their big final showdown among the ruins of the future that could have been. She's trying to kill the Joker, and he's trying to stop her and save her soul. Cue the music. See, Batman is not the protagonist. Yeah, he's the main character of the movie, but this is really Andrea's story, about her doomed romance with Bruce and how her life was consumed by vengeance. This builds to the astounding climactic moment as the massive series of explosives the Joker has rigged detonate and the entire world's fair is engulfed in flames, symbolically killing any hope for Bruce and Andrea once and for all as Shirley Walker's magnificent score reaches operatic heights and the Joker... Just watch the clip. So, this animated kids movie is the story of a doomed, tragic romance. It's about two people whose chance for happiness was destroyed by violence and revenge. It's a superhero movie with no happy ending. And by the way, this movie is only 75 minutes long. It does all of this in half the time of The Dark Knight or The Dark Knight Rises and still manages a deeper exploration of Batman's psyche. I promise you. If this same script were made as the next live-action Batman movie, people would lose their goddamn minds and declare it the greatest superhero film of all time. Okay, so now I'm just gonna list a bunch of my favorite little details about this movie, because there are a lot. The way Batman stomps on the table after he flipped it onto that goon. Joker hiding in the model Chrysler building. When the Phantasm murders a guy by dropping a huge angel-shaped tombstone on him. Bruce's line to Arthur Reeves. Thanks for the handkerchief, Arthur. You know where you can stick it. Basically everything Alfred says. Oh, by the way, I've pressed your tights and put away your exploding gas balls. Young Harvey Bullock as a uniformed cop in this one flashback. This close-up of Batman. The little moments of Batman trying to figure out his crime-fighting identity. Sal Valester's facial expression right here. This shot of Sal after the Joker killed him, which terrified me as a child. Your angel of death awaits. <laughs> Pretty much every shot of the World's Fair in the finale. The jetpack. I love how destroyed Batman gets in the scene where the police are after him. There's a tension and desperation that we never see in Batman movies. And finally, the moment where Joker chooses a stick of baloney instead of a knife to use as a weapon. Anyway, I've just been thinking about this a lot lately. I wanted to get it off my chest and let you know how I feel. Mask of the Phantasm is the best Batman movie. For some reason, it's still unavailable on Blu-ray, but here. You guys can borrow my DVD copy. That's all. See you later. You want to stay for dinner? Sorry, I can't. Did he drink that entire bottle? I think he did. I got it. I, I know what I'm doing. And action. Do I have a line? 
I forgot my line. <laughs> no, I just go, uh. Okay, okay, I got it. Go. I love it. Don't get I me in the you, outtake, 